he sent me the task of explaining um, the challenges involved in extracting the knowledge contained in the SIFs that we produce and making sure that the data generated by the crystallographic community is used as widely as possible in science. So that's what I'll try and address today and I'll try and focus on some of the challenges that, uh, that lie therein. I'll need to start with a very short introduction about the CCDC, just to put some of my thoughts and comments into context, I'll give a very few words on, on the CSD itself, and then we'll try and move um, quickly into some of the challenges that um, we face at the CCDC and that we face as a crystallographic community. So the CCDC isn't there for its own benefit, it's there for the benefit of um, scientists in all disciplines where a not-for-profit charitable organization and our raison d'etre is to create, curate and distribute the CSD. Um, this is a difficult task. Uh, the number of crystallographic structures determined grows every year. Um, we process around about 50,000 structures a year now. That's 200 a day. Um, there are many more transactions than that in that the, the structures that we get often have to be supplied to referees, um, we often get revisions, they may be intended to be published in, in one particular journal and actually be published in a different journal. So this 50,000 structures here represents um, a, a great deal of effort. Um, sitting on top of the CSD is a CSD system. So this is now a really powerful suite of software, I'm sure almost everyone in the room has used um, some aspects of the CSD system and this really allows us to extract the knowledge that's contained in this collection of SIFs and we continue to develop all aspects of the CSD system. We also provide access to the original deposited data we get from crystallographers. Those individual data sets are available to anyone and we do that without cost to the individual or institution who wants to use those um, deposited SIFs. That's in contrast to um, paying to publish data or to publish journal articles. We also provide many software tools for, for, for no cost. I guess Mercury is, is probably one of the most used pieces of software for examining crystal structures and we provide targeted subsets of curated data for particular purposes. Now, as I said before, creating the CSD is, is quite a challenge um, and over the years the CCDC has developed um, some very complex procedures for handling um, those crystal structures and Mike did a really good job of describing um, the life or the world of a publisher. Now the CCDC is a secondary publisher and we face many of the same challenges in terms of making sure the right data goes to the right people at the, the right time. But the real scientific thing we do is convert the coordinates we get to a, a chemical representation that allows <coughs> computational searching of those structures. And that's the fundamental contribution that the CCDC makes, as well as ensuring that there's as wide a distribution and access to those structures as possible. Recently, we've invested really heavily in a new procedure for processing crystal structures. We call this CSD Expedite and launched this in, in April. This has replaced the very complex scripts that we've had in the past with a, a much more streamlined, automated pathway for taking structures and creating the CSD. This has made us much, much more efficient. Um, it's all based on Microsoft SharePoint, Microsoft Dynamics CRM, um, and the life of our structure editors has, has really changed dramatically since April. We've also had to invest in some major new hardware as well because to provide a, a service as reliable as the CSD needs to be to as many users as we support does take significant infrastructure. Expedite's brought us lots of advantages. Um, Similar to the challenges at the PDB, the, the CCDC also faced challenges with large structures and Expedite has also allowed us to, much, to, to handle structure factors much more appropriately than we did in the past and we'll return to the question as to whether it's time to mandate structure factors now prior to issuing a, a, C, a CSD number. We can now pro provide much easier access to deposited data, um, can better compare and check structures and we're in a position to issue, issue DOIs for CSD entries. Perhaps most dramatically is that we can now take a structure from deposition to release 
and for a straightforward structure that'll take us less than 10 minutes. Um, in the past, the quickest we could do that was around about 10 days. Um, it could take up to a month. So this has really transformed the way we operate. And it also allows us to um, enable community curation, and that's something we'll come back to as well. There's some scientific advantages. We can handle polymers um, in a, a, a much better way than we could before. Um, often this leads to, to much smaller poly polymeric units that are much more representative of the chemistry that's actually going on. We're able to handle ADPs much better than before, and we have a much more consistent interpretation of chemistry now. So our main challenge is to take coordinates and turn them into, into chemistry. And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on how we do that. Um, it's challenging. Um, here's some challenging cases, um, and, and they represent the typical things that our structure editors need to do. So often from coordinates, it's very difficult to, to determine a bond order or perhaps an oxidation state, perhaps understand the charges of a molecule, whether things should be denoted as an aromatic system or not. And, and these are difficult to do computationally. Um, so what we what we've developed is, is a system that allows us to look both at the coordinates that we see and the geometry of the molecules that we see with respect to what we've already observed in the CSD. And we've developed a system called Decipher. So Decipher combines geometric information from our molecules with information from observations in the CSD and allows us to come up with an assignment of the most probable chemistry represented in a particular SIF file. And this representation of most probable chemistry is then reviewed by our structure editors and they can then sign off on that structure and say, yes, actually this automated method has determined whether it's a dihydrofuran or a tetrahydrofuran. Um, or they can say, no, actually, I think although there aren't many structures of this type in the CSD, this molecule is actually a, a, a dihydrofuran. Um, one of the key reasons why we go to this level of curation is that it avoids the duplication of effort. So one could simply collect SIFs, put them in a database, do a minimum of curation and allow users to use those, those uncurated SIFs. Um, what would happen then is on accessing any SIF, a chemist would first have to make sure that the chemistry of that SIF was correctly represented. Now, it's much more cost effective for, for science for this to be done once. It doesn't necessarily need to be done by the CCDC, but it is much more effective if this is actually done once, rather than everyone who's using a structure having to check and having to um, ensure that that structure is, is really represented right chemically. So we do try and curate structures such that we can avoid duplication of effort. And if others do want to recurate that structure, that can be layered on top of what we've already done. But we have some challenges, um, and that's what I'm going to turn to now. The first challenge I'm going to address is the discoverability of crystal structure data. And Samir teed this up wonderfully for me. Um, so the CSD and the CSD system are ubiquitous in structural chemistry. So every research university with a chemistry department has access and uses the CSD. Every pharma company, every biotech company has access and uses the CSD. Um, but what we don't see is the same level of penetration outside the structural chemistry community. And this is a challenge we need to address. Um, now, Samir talked about the, the problems of ligands in PDB entries. I'm just going to talk through one example of those problems. And this is a paper from Nature from 30th of May this year. Um, the authors published this paper on this particular interaction, this CRAS PDE delta interaction. Um, Nature published an article that said they generated a drug for this undruggable protein. Firstly, it's not a drug, it's, it's an inhibitor. Secondly, um, the first time this has been described as an undruggable protein, I think, is in this article. Um, but moreover, um, this paper focuses to, to some degree on the interactions of this ligand in this particular um, signaling complex. Here's a 2D structure of this ligand. Here's a 3D structure of this ligand bound to that protein. Has a uh, piperidine in here and an ester in the center here. This ring conformation, even at first glance, seems rather unusual. There isn't a single instance in the CSD of a ring conformation anything like that. This is an ester. Let's look at that in some more detail. 
Um, this graph shows a distribution of the torsion angles of esters in the CSD. Esters are planar. End of story. Esters are planar. This ester has a torsion <coughs> angle of about 95 degrees. It couldn't possibly be more wrong. Um, now, who's to blame for that? Well, it's actually us. It's actually the CCDC and the small molecule crystallographic community. We've singularly failed to demonstrate the relevance and the value of small molecule crystal structures to the protein community. So we need to do something about that. And we're starting through collaborations um, with the PDB and, and Samir introduced the kind of things that, that we're doing. But the other thing that we need to look at is whether the business models that we adopt in small molecule crystallography are actually to some degree responsible for this awful science. Um, we have a licensing model that um, requires people to sign up for access to, to the CSD. And that undoubtedly puts off the casual users. And that might be why we start to see structures uh, as awful as this one in, in, um, in journals still, still today. So we'll return to that shortly. Um, we'd also like to encourage more depositions. Um, we get about 50,000 structures per year, but that's a very small fraction of the number of structures that are actually determined. Now, um, both the CCDC and the IUCR recognized this some time ago. The IUCR launched Actory, which was a place for um, high-quality crystal structure determinations to be, to be published. And um, for the past five years or so, we've got round about 350 structures um, in the CSD from Actory per month. Um, this has really dropped off for 2013 relating to Thomson Reuters no longer issuing impact factors for, for Actor E. So I haven't drawn the plot for 2012, but it will be a significantly reduced number of structures for 2013, sorry. It'll be significantly reduced for 2012. Um, we've seen no sign that other publications are taking up those structures. So the likelihood is they're being lost to science. And that's something that we really need to think about. CCDC will assign DOIs to entries. We've now got a system that enables us to do that. Um, that might encourage more people to deposit structures directly with the, C with the CSD, even if there isn't an accompanying publication. But it might not. Through very, very gritted teeth, um, the CCDC has applied for the CSD to be listed in the Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index. I say through gritted teeth because it was Thomson Reuters who decided that Actor E um, really uh, oughtn't to be issued, um, uh, oughtn't be part of their citation index. And it seems fundamentally wrong that a commercial organization like Thomson Reuters can have such sway over the um, publication patterns of uh, an area of science. That that doesn't sit well with me at all. But one thing we need to do is to think about what else we can do to encourage publication. And again, we'll return to that. Um, we want to have enriched depositions as well. It takes a lot of work to take a CIF file in a publication and turn it into a CSD entry. Um, our editors um, take structures, they take a report generated by Decipher, and they read the accompanying paper for a particular structure and decide, decide how to represent that in the database. They have to extract lots of data from a PDF file. Perhaps the melting point might be in a PDF file, but may well not be in the SIF. Our editors read that PDF file, extract it, and put it in the database. That really is pathetic, because the vast majority of information our editors extract has, at one point in time, been properly represented semantic data. We heard a fantastic talk um, right at the start of the meeting from Simon on um, laboratory information management systems, um, electronic lab, lab notebooks. We're getting to a situation now where vast amount of experimental information is being electronically recorded. It's then being lost and put into a PDF file and turned back into semantic information. That really is a waste of time in the scientific community. Um, it's really, really difficult to do. Peter may touch on, on efforts to extract information from PDFs. This is a tremendous challenge. Um, the thing that's, that's kind of sad about this is it's actually an unnecessary activity as well. If we changed the way we work, we wouldn't have to do this. But, yeah, I guess we, we've got to the stage now where we really need to take a decision as to whether we can actually change the way we work or whether the right response is to actually accept the fact that this is the way the scientific discipline works and we have to put up with it. 
Um, okay, so I talked through some, some challenges. Um, and I'm going to leave you with some questions. Um, these are questions, some of which have, have come up today, some of which um, we were aware of well before the meeting. Um, one of the things that I'd like to throw out to the community is um, whether it's time to mandate the deposition of structure factors with small molecule crystal structures. This happened um, with the PDB oh, over 10 years ago now. It's still not the case with small molecule crystal structures. So in non-crystallographic publications, uh, structure <coughs> factors aren't mandatory. Now, the difficulty we have here is who decides um, whether or not publications are acceptable without structure factors. Now, we could say the journals, or we could say that could be the CCDC. And the CCDC would refuse to issue a CCDC number if a structure was deposited without structure factors. But that puts the CCDC in a, a rather um, authoritative position. And I am a little uncomfortable in assuming the role of the, uh, of the person who decides um, whether CCDC numbers should be published and therefore whether a paper should be published with and without structure factors. So it's probably a role for the IUCR to actually think about that um, recommendation or, 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 or otherwise. Um, for a while now, CCDC has encouraged the deposition of structure factors. We've recently changed to recommending the deposition of structure factors. I personally think the time has come for mandating structure factors to be deposited with structures now and not issuing a CCDC number. But I'd rather that was a community decision, not a decision of mine. And I'd welcome input on, on how we get that, uh, that community uh, on board. I mentioned that the CCDC provides free access to individual SIFs. Um, I think in the past we've been very comfortable that that um, serves the community quite well. Um, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. Um, as we move towards um, an environment where mining of, of knowledge from data is, is common practice, um, we might want to think about whether um, a SIF collection should be available free to all. That ties into business models. Um, at the moment, the crystallographic community funds the CSD at point of use. We seek contributions from all of our users. Um, now, because we seek contributions from users, that requires us to ask that those users don't share the CSD. So we're, in a sense, financing the CSD on the principle of denying access to data for some individuals. So that's the reality of what we do. Now, in practice, um, anyone who wants access to the CSD has access to the CSD. So the contributions we ask for are relatively modest. If people can't find funding for those contributions, then they can access the CSD anyway. But what it does do is prevent that casual use. So that's something that we really need to address. Now, we could simply say, well, research councils can pay um, for the CSD. Um, and that's currently the model in many countries. We have national affiliated centers in, in many countries who seek funding from their national research councils. And that funds access to the CSD for anyone in that, na in that um, nation. Um, I think you heard from Simon that the situation in the UK is, is really hopelessly confused. We have, um, on one hand, research councils saying, yes, it's entirely appropriate for us to fund data repositories. And on the other hand, we have them saying, well, actually, no, the communities should fund those, uh, those uh, repositories and, and universities should do it. It's a very, very complex situation. But we could start to think about how we operate as a community as well. So the crystallographic community, for example, could say, right, any paper that carries a crystal structure, we'll all make sure that that's open access. We'll lead the way here as a, as a community. We can say that all of our supplementary data will be in a semantic form. We can, we can initiate that by making sure we all pay APCs for papers or APCs for data. These are the kind of things that we can address as a community. And these are the questions that I'd like to leave you with. just want to thank some people. So Ian Bruno, who's, who's here, really is a, a thought leader for CCDC in this area. Suze Ward, who's our operations manager for the CSD, and Matt Lightfoot, who's our um, editor-in-chief of, of, of the CSD, in charge of the, the science of the CSD. All the folks at the CCDC. And the other people to thank are the over quarter of a million authors who've appeared on publications which have contained crystal structures. So, thank you.